It's easy to hear your favorite artist on WFPK from wherever you are. Listen on your smart speaker, live stream from our website at WFPK.org, from Louisville Public Media. Consequence Podcast Network. Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with... The interview series that's presented by WFPK Independent Louisville at WFPK.org, Consequence of Sound, and the Consequence Podcast Network. If you're not a subscriber to the series, I do hope you take that second to follow along. We release new interviews every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And if you're the type of music nerd who likes hearing artists talk all about their work and how it all came into creation, uh, this is a great series for you to follow. You can do so at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere you get your favorite podcast from. And thanks to everyone who's already a subscriber. I always love hearing your comments uh, in the comment boxes or the reviews section, you know, what you liked about the interviews. I always appreciate those. I'm Kyle Meredith. Today I'm talking with tennis. Specifically, Elena Moore is going to be uh, on the phone to talk about tennis's new album called Swimmer. Now, it's a record with a, a lot of layers. For their fifth album, they did head back out on the boat, ended up in the Sea of Cortez in Mexico for a part of it, as well as writing in Denver. Uh, it was what they call a really dark time in their life, maybe one of the darkest times in their life. So you really get that in the lyrics that deal with death, what sounds like toxic friendships, but also love, uh, love that talks about death and how the two intertwine in both families and relationships, and also pure love. Yes, there it's not all darkness and clouds. As Elena wrote a song for Patrick for their, their 10th wedding anniversary, which ends up being a sequel to a, an older song of theirs called Matrimony. You get Matrimony 2 on this record, so we'll talk about that. And I also want to hear about life on the boat this time around. What was it like sailing around the Sea of Cortez? In fact, that's not a part of the world that I'm all that familiar with, so Elena's going to give us some uh, geography lessons and what the day-to-day was like when you're you're living your life on a boat at the mercy of nature and while trying to write an album. We'll also get the story behind an album track called Echoes, which was a, a scary moment for Elena personally as uh, she ended up in the hospital while on tour. And speaking of tour, the band is going out. They'll be out all this spring into the summer, so we'll hit on that as well. So let's jump into it. Discussing the new record Swimmer, it's Kyle Meredith with Tennis. How are you? First off, uh, Tennis, uh, you're going to be back in Louisville May 8th at Headliners. We're excited to have you back in town again, uh, touring behind the new record Swimmer, which I have enjoyed uh, listening to so much. And, and It hasn't been all that long, but it feels like it's just been long enough that we were really wanting this record. Uh, and You were living it, but did it feel a little bit extra for you as well? You know, I actually felt like the perfect amount of time. We toured so hard around yours conditionally, and then we added the EP like at the tail end of that, we can die happy. And I actually just had this feeling like I had been writing so much by the end of that, that I needed a huge long break from it. And so it lasted just long enough to where I was really, really ready to make a new record. So for me, the timing feels really good. Well, I know there's a lot that goes into this record and and, and I feel like there's a lot of story, um, both in your lives, but also kind of packed into these songs. And and I'll get to that. I, I thought I'd start a little bit lighter because, you know, part of this story is, you know, we go back to the boat and you spend some time, as I read about in the Sea of Cortez in Mexico. And, and I don't know anything about that region. I was, c- could you tell us a little bit about it? Uh, yeah, I knew nothing about the region. I'm embarrassed to say I had an extremely terrible geography education. I think Pat read about it in a blog and found like a guidebook that you could sail there. And he pitched it to me one day and I was like, literally, what is the Sea of Cortez and what are you talking about? <laughs> but it's actually a really incredible experience to have your first impression of a place be you having sailed there offshore over the course of, it takes about a month or so to get there from California. So I, in a world where pretty much everything has been done and discovered and explored, it's the most like feeling like you're an old timey explorer. It's a really thrilling feeling, honestly, to just show up at some like at a small fishing cove after weeks of being at sea, having known nothing about the place. I don't know. It's a really incredible feeling that I'm really, I'm addicted to at this point. So what are your lives like in, in that moment? Like what's your day-to-day consist of in a place like that? It's really structured, which is why I like sailing a lot. I have 
insane anxiety (laughs) that I uh, really didn't understand until I kind of came into adulthood. And I've learned that structure and routine is my salvation. And the boat, it's almost like living more in a militarized fashion where everything that you do revolves around the maintenance and care of the vessel. Otherwise, you die. Um, so there's never an instance of slacking off or giving in to your fear or your just lesser instincts, I guess. It makes you be the best version of yourself. You're always solving problems. So yeah, I mean, a day on the boat, if we're on a passage and we're at sea, then our day is split up into two hour shifts that Patrick and I switch off taking because somebody needs to always be in the cockpit on watch making sure that we're steering our course and checking navigation and because you're up 24 hours a day you sleep in like two hour increments throughout the day so you you're sleeping when you're off watch and then when you're on watch you're the captain and that is consumes every aspect of your life until you make landfall and When we are living at anchor and we're no longer journeying somewhere, then our days revolve around we have to check the weather morning and night because, you know, we're in the wilderness and need to make sure that wherever we are isn't about to be hit by a storm where our anchorage is suddenly unsafe, um, which happens a lot. So we'll have to move around locations like we'll circumnavigate an island based on the wind direction. So we do that every day. And it's very humbling to live at the mercy of weather. And you just kind of fall into this very quiet routine of noticing wind shifts and even the current changing. And the rest of the day is just boat projects. Something is breaking all the time. Salt water is extremely corrosive and just tends to destroy everything that you bring, including instruments or gear or anything. So the day is just maintaining the ship, making sure we are provisioned properly and following the weather. And it's really beautiful. <laughs> I'm, I love it. Yeah. It, it would seem like there would be points, though, that you would be li- living in a bit of a, a dream state. Yeah, you definitely lose track of days because weather and tidal shift is much more significant. So it's really interesting to mark passing of time through the way I've learned the way that the weather, the wind clocks around like literally the face of a clock as high and low pressure systems move through. So you start to know based on the direction of the wind whether or not a low pressure is coming, which is really amazing. It feels like some kind of old esoteric knowledge, even though, of course, it's like super basic science, which, again, somehow I missed in my education. <laughs> but it's really fun to feel like you really understand it on a intuitive level. And so somewhere in all of this, you, you write music, too, and, and you, you try to be creative. Is that something that you find comes natural in, in those moments? Because I know part of this, you know, also written at home on land in Denver. But but while you're out there, it, do you do you have to work at that, like, I don't know, harder? Or, or is it, you know, normal, I guess? It's, it's really incredible, actually. There is nothing to do <laughs> on the boat <laughs> at all except your work. So if we've done all of our work around the boat for the day and there's nothing to be done and we don't need to move anchorages. There's literally nothing. You can only hike the same hill or swim the same lap around your boat so many times before you're out of distractions. And I'm not a really sporty person anyway. I've always been an indoor girl. So we basically read uh, an incredible amount of books and then the rest of the time we're just writing The writing definitely looks different on the boat than it does on land. We don't have access to most of our instruments or our studio, and I primarily play piano, so I can't do that much composition. So I'm more writing lyrics. But yeah, I mean, for me, that whole there's like this window in the middle of the day where there you can't look at a phone because you have no cell signal and you can't get online because there's no internet and you can't buy anything because you're nowhere and there's nothing to be bought. And so the usual distractions that creep into my day that I'm trying to shield myself from when we write at home in Denver, those are just fully removed when we're sailing. And that's why I like it so much. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like three completely different lives, one at sea, 
one on tour and then one at home in Denver. I mean, are, are those like as huge of cultural shifts as it sort of sounds like to me? Yeah, it's very jarring. Although the extremes are really powerful when you, it makes you have a lot, it gives me a lot of gratitude for each individual part of my life. I find myself really looking forward to just simple domesticity home in Denver where I can just do laundry or go to a grocery store and things are easy and I have my community versus the experience of being in the wilderness and everything is extremely slow but structured and honestly a lot more ascetic and then compared to the really like overstimulated life of touring where it's just city after city tons and tons of people so much human connection I don't know I feel like I like to work my way through each extreme I don't know the juxtaposition is is very it's become very foundational to my life And then to have that much time to just kind of dwell on things, I mean, I'm taking a line that you've said here, like, this record represents a tour of the darkest time in your lives, um, without trying to be voyeuristic, you know, within that topic right there. But to have sort of all of that time to dwell on that, that's to me, that sounds at least a little bit scary. Well, I guess when, if you are a writer and you live through something painful, the only silver lining is that it gave you something to write about. (laughs) And I think I was in a almost a morbid way. I was already thinking about that while we were enduring death and illness and just a lot of tumult within our family and our personal lives. I just kept thinking, at least I will have so much to say on this next album. (laughs) And it's interesting how you've kind of pushed it all together too, uh, death and love sometimes intertwining in the same moments. Uh, and you know, I, I can take the, um, uh, the first song's last line, uh, beautifully written. I will haunt you when I'm gone. I mean, that's, that's a hell of a line right there. Thanks. Yeah. In a, there was a moment when, um, I feel like every partnership or marriage or like long-term relationship will have this where you go through some new very intense experience together and there might be a little bit of trepidation about how it will affect your partnership and for pat and i when his dad died and we were on tour which was the worst thing we could ever imagine happening there was a moment where i was very horrified patrick and i have just this great supportive friendship at the foundation of everything and i was really worried how it would affect us because it really fucked us up. And you know, you don't know how you're going to end up treating the person who you can show your worst self to your most pain, your most, you know, and instead of it driving us apart, which I really, I could have seen that ruining our marriage, but instead somehow we like dug deep and bonded on a new level that I didn't even know. I didn't know there was a level up from what we had, but there was, and it was so powerful, uh, which is why I bookended the record with these love songs, just very intimate songs that I wrote for Pat, I'll Haunt You, and then Matrimony 2 at the end of the record. Calling it Matrimony 2, did you mean it to be an actual sequel in, in, in its entirety or, or just in maybe title alone? It's a sequel, not at all musically, so I hope I don't throw anyone off who is expecting it to sound anything like Matrimony, the first song. But I see this as um, something that I will continue to do throughout our relationship. Matrimony, the first song, details our wedding day, and Matrimony 2, I wrote for Patrick on our 10-year wedding anniversary. So for me, it's like the reflection of that same day and of our relationship 10 years later. And I am quite sure that I will write a Matrimony 3 whenever uh, the time demands. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good promise, especially if, if you're promising to haunt someone anyway. I think uh, this is a, a sort of a before sunrise sort of series I see happening here, if you're familiar with the original Linkletter uh, series. Oh, my God. It's such a good trilogy. I love it so much. And I am really interested in the way an intimate partnership transforms over time. And I, you know, I am a huge fan of of the the love song. You know, it's archetypal. It's like a staple of all of music. But for me, I've, I think I want to carve out my niche within like that kind of writing to be about exploring 
marriage, which I feel like is just my own. I feel like that's something that I can contribute that's meaningful to type of songwriting that has already been done a million ways a million times. Now, with a song, though, like Need Your Love, I mean, you would look at that as a title and think that you were following in that tradition as well. But there's that, that that's a flip right there that you don't expect when you just look at the title. Like, you, you're taking that whole thing and turning it around, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's uh, not about Pat. <laughs> that's just, uh, yeah, I just let myself vent about a just a difficult relationship that I had in my life, a friendship. And I normally resist the emotion of anger. I don't feel like it's good for me, (laughs) for my health or my mental state. It's what was going on immediately in my life while we were writing. And I felt like the song had a bit of pent up aggression. I feel like Patrick and I, our writing always has like a little bit of a level of reservedness to it, even in the sense that we write more like mid-tempo songs um, in general. But I, I don't feel like it's because we're being false or holding something back. I feel like it's just true to the nature of ourselves. So I felt like that's Need Your Love is me at my angriest, believe it or not, which isn't that angry. It's more um, sarcastic and a little bit bitter, a little bit self-righteous. Um, but that's kind of what anger looks like when I feel it. And uh, I just feel like it really served the song. Yeah, well, it's it, it makes it even more interesting that that's the song with the most jarring time change in the middle of it. Yes. Yeah, that was all intentional. I wanted the song, you know, my, my inner, my self-talk, I guess, like especially when I'm upset, I tend to spiral through all the things that I wish I could say, but I have way too much self-restraint to ever say it. And so I never do. And then I just end up punishing myself (laughs) with this inner dialogue. Uh, So I just wrote it into the song and we felt like making it as kind of chaotic and disjointed as possible was like the most accurate reflection of what it felt for me to be in that state of mind. And further on, too, because a lot of these songs, I noticed, uh, whether it's intentional or not, it sounds to me like your voice is sort of mixed like an instrument is. Uh, it's not always like laying right on top as like, you know, some pop songs would do or something like that. But but then you get to the song Echoes and everything becomes so very clear with your voice. Of course, you would never know by the way that it came out in its final iteration, but I actually wrote most of Echoes on the boat, which is rare for me. And I wrote it on acoustic guitar, which is also rare for me because I'm a terrible guitar player. But I knew I wanted... Echoes is just a pretty straightforward narrative of one of the experiences that I had on tour where I, I got the flu and I lost consciousness and really it was terrifying and I had to be hospitalized and I had to cancel some shows. And this was one week before Pat's dad died on the same tour. So this was kind of the buildup to all of our disaster. And I really wanted to tell that story very specifically. And I, it reminded me of something more like a Paul Simon song. He's so good at making a song a short story. So that's how I approached my writing. And that, I think for that reason, it ended up with a very like vocals on top kind of mix. But by the time we were tracking the song, we went like totally off the rails um, with the production and we wanted it to be like a lot more almost like delirious feeling with all those like just like an unending guitar solo over the entire thing. It it just goes to show there's so many little moments that make up this record, and and that's why I love it so much, because because in one sense, you can put this record on in the background if if you're just looking for something to to have on, and it's this really nice record. It's a fun record. It kind of bounces along. You can have a sunshiny day, and then turn right around and concentrate on the lyrics and get the exact different story of something like that. And it's... um, it's a magnificent trick. That's what I'm saying. I'm so glad that that is how you experience it because that's what I want our writing to be. I don't want it to... I, I want... Patrick and I both want to write a record that you could put on in the background while you cook dinner or while you have friends over and you're hanging out or whatever or while you're driving but then if you want to spend some time with it, it's layered and layered with meaning. And those are always my favorite types of art, whether it's 
literature or a film or whatever where you keep going back and finding more layers and that's that's what I want it to be. Absolutely. Full agreement. And uh, and I know you get that from Swimmer. I thank you for this music. I'll mention it again. Tennis is going to be back in Louisville May 8th at Headliners. So we're really excited to hear how these songs kind of open up live as well. And uh, And I thank you for the conversation today. Thanks, Kyle. I was really excited when I saw that we were going to have a chat today. I was really looking forward to it. <laughs> it's great to talk to you again. Uh, I can't wait to see you guys. I'll be there in the, at the show uh, when you guys uh, hit here in town. Awesome. Can't wait. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye. And my thanks to Elena Moore. The new tennis record is called Swimmer. You have to check it out. It is absolutely fantastic. Now, of course, this isn't the first time that I've spoken with tennis. In fact, I'm going to include two other interviews from the past. And uh, part two finds us back in 2017 when the duo was releasing Yours Conditionally. It was a record rich with 70s style pop rock that found the duo exploring themes of the traditions of marriage, gender, and love. So let's jump into that one too. Part two of Kyle Meredith with tennis. Hi, Kyle. Well, congratulations. I really am in love with uh, yours conditionally and everything that you have going on Thank with you. this. What I'm impressed with is, I don't know, I guess the balance of, of, of what you've pulled off with this record because it seems like here are really personal love songs while at the same time you're obviously... Uh, as the story goes, you're telling a bigger story of, of being a woman and a musician and the challenges you face, uh, especially in 2017 in the current environment. Was that a higher wire act for you? Yeah, I wasn't sure if I would be able to make it work, <laughs> actually. <laughs> I feel like it came out okay. Yeah, one of the things I was kind of, I, was, I talk with Patrick about this a lot, which is how do I write, how do I write a love song that, even comes close to conveying what it's like to be like deep into the flow of like a long term marriage, you know, of a marriage essentially, as opposed to like it's not really the sentiment that you normally get in a love song. Um, and so I thought if I'm going to continue to write about that, I want to describe something more that more true to my lived experience of love, which is in like a totally different place. And, um, also, to my experience of being a woman, because I do have a lot of conflicting feelings. Sometimes, I mean, as a feminist, I know that there are a lot of other women or feminists who think that, like, by getting married, you're, like, choosing to, like, normalize or, like, elevate marriage as, you know, an institution. And I actually have, like, a lot of conflicting and critical feelings about marriage. And it wasn't a decision that Patrick or I took lightly. And so that was another thing, like, how can I express, like... This, this like vast array of um, sort of like conflicting beliefs about like womanhood. Like it was almost like what what aspects of convention am I allowed to have or want as a woman, and what parts should I reject as a feminist? Uh, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's something that I kind of had to just negotiate a day at a time. Lots and lots of conversations between Patrick and I. So when I started writing lyrics for this record. It was kind of just natural. It wasn't very premeditated. I just, that's where my head was at. We were coming up on our 10 year anniversary, which was kind of baffling to me um, in the same way that, you know, you suddenly notice you're 30 and your 20s have left and you've got, you're going to be coming on to your 10 year anniversary. And you're like, wow, when did this happen? And suddenly you're just at this new phase in life. So that's kind of the only thing I wanted to, to work through when we were making this record. I mean, I'll say that it really hits close to home for us, too, because me and my wife uh, is similar. You've been married longer, um, but she's also an activist. Uh, she's a she's a really great activist. Yeah. And we've had these same conversations. So to hear someone tackle such a unique and specific story, you know, there's I, I know there's a danger that, you know, who's going to relate exactly to this. But yeah. As it turns out, you do, you know, and, and it's out there. I mean, everyone can relate to love and, and relationships. And, and I think a, a lot of people are interested in the bigger conversation right now. So the fact that you pulled it off is a, no small feat. <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you. I mean, it's, it's something that I don't feel done with and I want to keep thinking about it because I feel like my generation wants to have marriage, but in a, in a different way, you know, like we want to redefine it and it's hard to try and build something for yourself that you haven't seen modeled anywhere in the world. So sometimes I'm not sure, you know, how naive and I and that, like if it's realistic or possible, but um, I want to try, you know, hence the words yours conditionally, because I think the first step towards improving the popular notion of marriage or the conventional understanding of marriage is that it's not about like these universal parameters that can't be broken, you know, like in sickness and in health, rich or for poor, for better or worse. I, I really resisted those. We didn't even make those vows to each other because I was like, what if... I take all of our credit cards and I run us into credit card debt. <laughs> I lose our home. I ruin your life, but you, you can never leave me because you said a, you signed a piece of paper and you said a vow that you, what if I turn into a terrible person <laughs> and I'm like a horrible manipulative, you know, it's like, that would be crazy. That would be like, you know, it's just, I don't even understand the purpose of those vows. And I feel like it sets you up for failure and it sets you up for like not seeing each other as like separate autonomous people with their own freedoms. And yeah, I just, we, this is like all the stuff that we think about all the time. And we're like, it's not it, it just, like, if you're, if we were joking about signing a love letter, yours conditionally because we have healthy boundaries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it, it, it's of course a really interesting time to be talking about this because I feel like, you know, and this probably happens every so often, but I feel like we're finally taking the time to, uh, I don't know, clean up our house, <laughs> as if I want to say, yeah. as a people, as a race, as a nation. I'm talking about a human race, by the way. Yeah. But even with the Tasmanian yeah. devil that's busting through right now, we're still taking stock mm -hmm. of, of what was ignored and pushed aside and, and giving it its due cleaning. And that goes with, you know, what you're talking about with relationships and, and in the bigger feminist yeah. uh, aspect as well. Exactly. I feel the exact same way. I feel like um, we have just been ignoring a lot of things, um, which has have, have allowed like conflict and division and all this these misconceptions of things to grow, and it's just kind of like exploded in recent years. And now everyone's having to deal with it, like the the painful truth. And yeah, I feel like it's just like the perfect time for introspection and and as you said like cleaning house and just getting your yeah. together basically yeah. well there are two songs i would like to uh at, at least hit on here and and one is of course mm -hmm. uh ladies don't play guitar which i'm sure has been getting quite a lot of attention just based off the title alone but uh <laughs> what, what, what's the story behind this one because it sort of reminds me of of that horrible line that would go around forever like oh women aren't funny yeah, totally. So um, the, that line, ladies don't play guitar, came to me when I was, I was, I had been reflecting on the difference in mine and Patrick's experience on tour. We just finished touring a lot for Ritual and Repeat. And it, it was it's mostly, you know, subtle little things, um, nothing dramatic. And then we were home, we were writing again, and I was trying to convey a guitar part, an electric guitar part, like a lead solo line that I heard, and I was trying to like show him it or play it for him, but I can't play electric guitar, and it was really frustrating. And I was like, in that moment, I was like, the only reason why I'm not playing this for you right now is because ladies don't play guitar. I was given a piano instead of an electric guitar, because just of an accident of gender, my parents were like you'll learn piano and I did <laughs> and not and whereas Patrick boy his parents were like what do you want to play electric guitar here you go like no one I'm pretty sure that no one offered him piano lessons mm -hmm. um and I'm not I don't I'm not I have no resentment towards it I'm I love playing piano that's my primary instrument and my parents noticed that I enjoyed playing piano and they didn't force me to anything but I just noticed that it's just the accident of gender that I ended up with this entirely different skill set than Patrick and how we joke that I have an inner shredder that never got to, you know, see the light of day because I just happened to be a woman. So I didn't learn how to do that. So that's where the song came from. And as I parsed that out, um, a lot of other that after that, I ended up writing my emotions are blinding and just thinking about just gen constructions of gender and how 
they had been affecting my life in ways that I hadn't even noticed. And and then I want to take that further then, because in the song Baby Don't Believe, I'm kind of trying yeah. to figure out if you're doing a character in that, because there's the line, make me a man, which is not to say they have to do a character, but I guess that's the question. You mm-hmm. know, when that line comes out, uh, what are you hitting on right there? Yeah, so I am doing a character, which is unusual for me. And normally I wouldn't have put that in with the record, but I like it because um, I, I purposely chose Make Me a Man because I thought it made the sentiment so much more tender and meaningful of the line, give me your hand, make me a man. And I really like the idea of masculinity being. Uh, derived from tenderness and intimacy instead of what you'd normally consider it as being. And so I thought that Make Me a Man made the whole sentiment more powerful and more interesting and more meaningful to me. So I, I purposely chose it. I mean, it does. It stands out. You, you you can't help but hear that because, of course, that's not something that we hear every day. And, and there have been some songs in the past that have sort of pulled that off and and this being one of them. By the way, it's also really catchy. I mean, the whole record is really catchy, and I shouldn't, oh, thanks. I shouldn't uh, ignore that yeah, part either. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I really, and that was the last one we wrote, and I really, I loved writing that one. I actually think in the future, I'm going to continue to swap out my gender pronouns more often because I just think it's beneficial. I think we're at a time, like, culturally where it's useful to continue to subvert gender binary. So I'm, I think I'm probably going to be doing that more often in the future. That's cool. I can't wait to hear what the future brings. In the meantime, I will keep enjoying this record. Congratulations on yours conditionally again. Uh, I'm always impressed by what you guys do. So uh, thank you for the music and, uh, and the conversation today. I appreciate today. it. Yeah, it's really nice to catch up with you. And I hope the we actually might, I don't know, we might be playing in Louisville with soon um maybe this summer um so who knows maybe our paths will cross awesome in the next couple of months yeah yeah if, if you do uh Thanks make again. sure to yeah come on by the station you're always welcome i'd love that thank you all right take care okay bye bye again that's back from uh 2017 talking about the lp conditionally yours and now for part three we'll roll back to 2014 this was back on their uh, third record called ritual and repeat Part three of Kyle Meredith with tennis. Hi, guys. Hi. Hello. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. It, it's good to see you. Um, I feel like so much has happened, and, and we're going to be fair about this um, because I think every interview up until uh, recently, there's always been a backstory thing that's always course, had to be explained. Course. And this record seems like such the new birth for you guys that we're going to erase that. Thank you. And and give you an opportunity because I'm going to guess something else has happened in your life. Anything has happened in your life that you've had to have had more cool stories, believe it or not, at at, at this point. Yeah. Like if you had to start all over, what would it be? What would be the catch story now if if, if everything just started recently? If everything just started recently, it would be us. Um, I mean, the most immediate presence in our life is the band that we're doing now, which is so much newer and more imminent and than even the sailing trip now. Yeah. And yeah, when people ask about that, I'm like, I barely remember that. That feels like a dream. <laughs> what feels like a reality yeah. Yeah. is being on tour and like, you know, meeting with and working with some of our heroes musically mm-hmm. and Well, even just writing with a greater purpose, I feel like. Absolutely. I feel like our first album, it's like it's a documentary of sorts. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course there's a backstory with it and it makes it like romantic or whatever. Um, but these last few albums that we've put out, we've written with more purpose and we're trying to like communicate messages or ideas that are, I feel like beyond that documentary that Mm -hmm. was the first album. Sure. Yeah. I I feel like we're finally learning how to actually do something intentionally and feel like it's a true expression of ourselves creatively instead of just like a moment in time, like it's it's so different. It actually feels, even though it's our, this album Ritual and Repeat is not even remotely autobiographical, it feels so much closer to me than right. our first record did. Well, it's, it's interesting. I, I think artists might be one of the only uh, people that are kind of held to that kind of thing. Like, you're always attached yeah. to this yeah. one. Like Richie Havens once said, you know, I'll always be riding the Woodstock train. You know, yeah. or, or something like that. Like, if every album is a yearbook picture, and suddenly it's like you always have to be that awkward fourteen-year-old. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> very true. There is like a weird connection, not just with you know, 
the origin story of your music, but mm-hmm. even um, a friend pointed this out to me recently. I am pretty sure it was Joni Mitchell who said this, um, but I don't know for a fact. She said that being a musician, it's one of those weird um, you know, mediums as an artist where people want you to recreate the work oh, of art right, right. on demand mm-hmm. at any moment. Like you wouldn't ever ask, you know, a master painter to repaint. Just keep doing that one over and over again. One, yeah, yeah. you know, on on command. Yeah. But you know, you write a song and there's magic in it, and it means something to you in that moment. But people expect you to perform it over and over again with the same <laughs> conviction for the next like however many decades that they happen. I mean, that you're lucky enough that right, they like right, your song, right. but. There is this like weird ball and chain thing where you end up getting stuck to where you were years ago. It's an interesting lifestyle you guys have chosen. Apparently. Yeah. I don't think yeah. we really chose it. I think that's maybe the weirdest thing about our origin story uh, is that I don't think we chose this, or at least not intentionally. Not at first, but I'm so glad that yeah. we accidentally didn't do this, and now we are. We sound yeah. like jerks for saying that, because I know there's like tons of people who desperately want to do this. And... Yeah, But I, I was, I can say that because I was one of those people. Yeah, Like I tried my damnedest to do this for a living when I was in college. Like I literally worked my ass off in different bands and I tried like to intern with record labels and tried to play shows and none of the promoters would book me and all this stuff. And I literally got burned out from it, shut the door on the whole thing. I said I would never play music again. Threw in the towel. And then, like, what, five years went by, and then we started this band wow. unintentionally. I mean, a lot can happen in five years. Mm-hmm. You know, just Apparently, to change, yeah. your, you know, change your entire path. I mean, five years, when you look back on five years, a lot happens in there, and you could have done anything else. Especially yeah. at, like, that time in your life, those, like, formative years of going from, like, you know, your teenage life through college and after mm-hmm. college, those years, I feel like I changed more per year than any other time in my life. Like, these last five years, like... I haven't changed much. <laughs> I think that makes, yeah, but I, I think just it makes your hair. so, yeah, just, yeah just your hair quite a bit. But that makes a lot of sense because, I mean, you have to like live some life before sure. you can write about it. Sure. That's the thing that like young, starving artists, you know, 19, 20, maybe don't know yet. They have to just like go get some experiences under their belt. <laughs> and then it happens. Yeah. I, I know there is one little story that I'm sure you guys will be talking a lot about and it, it, that goes along with Ritual and Repeat and I guess ties in with the album title about having this writer's block and then suddenly you're mm-hmm. on a yeah. schedule to write, which is interesting. And and I want to kind of breeze past it uh, to another part, though, because you guys moved to Nashville. Yeah. We did. And, and you left Nashville because of, of whatever reason, but, I, but I, I was looking at that saying you guys accidentally... And, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, a book was referred to you about mm-hmm. uh, about uh, uh, ritual and, and whatever, um, yeah. schedules, right? Yeah, it was called Daily Rituals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and getting creative in that. And suddenly I thought, but that's how they write in Nashville. It, it almost seems yeah. so perfect. You know, when you, when you hear about mm-hmm. the country machine, you know, you go under fl- fluorescent lighting at 9 a.m., mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, with another person that you've barely met. And then for these next three hours, we're going to write. Yeah. yeah. And here you are in Nashville accidentally doing it the yeah. Nashville way. I, I mean, it wasn't, I feel like our night, like it wasn't so nine to five, like clock in, clock out as it was like us trying to get into like, you know, this, this weird moment where we would forget our conscious selves and then like hopefully our subconscious selves would speak a little bit. Yeah. But I mean, you have to trick yourself. You have to trick like your conscious, your inner critic and everything. You have to trick it away through just like pure, monotonous routine yeah. until like you get lulled into a stupor and you're just like playing piano playing piano and then you're like oh whoa what did i just do <laughs> like that was really good i think the difference or what i was trying to say mainly is that when we were done mm-hmm. we would just you know go to sleep sure. and then we'd wake up and do it over again we would never take a break and go like hang out with friends because yeah. we didn't have any well yeah we had no friends that was <laughs> um, the only reason or why. we would never like take a break and go out to dinner it was always just like we just stayed in this house for months and months and months and through this. You shouldn't be saying this because there's no reason why we didn't write like 17,000 <laughs> songs. I mean, you, you guys make <laughs> being a musician sound so romantic. Yeah. It was actually really fun. I, after so much touring the year yeah. before that, like I didn't care. I didn't want to mm-hmm. see one pocket of the world. I was like, I don't want to oh, see sure. anything. Yeah. I don't want to get on a plane. I don't want to get in a car. I just want to be in this house and like watch these birds like outside of my window and play guitar today or read a book and um it's it's I needed that experience though in order to appreciate the Nashville way Mm -hmm. which I totally would have been critical of Mm -hmm. thinking that that wasn't true artistry or something but I do not feel that way anymore not Mm -hmm. at all 
Now you can throw on some hot country every now and then and get no. down with the Florida Georgia line. Oh right? my god! <laughs> <laughs> um, sure, but no one who's ever, no artist who's ever done anything that I genuinely respect didn't have that like yeah. serious work ethic and yeah. and a lot of diligence and a lot of just pure time poured into it. Yeah. With with everything that came before this and and labels as they are and as annoying as they are to an artist. Uh, you guys were kind of lumped in with this kind of revivalist uh, uh, sound. Yeah. This album seems almost defiant mm -hmm. of that. Uh, how hard was it? I mean, this is a pop record. It is a great pop record. Thanks. This is, to me, the best thing that you guys have done, and I have just been in love with it since I've started listening to it, and I mean that. Um, in fact, I was really, I didn't, know that, I didn't know that you guys were on tour with Haim, but the first thing that I thought was, man, I wish they would go on tour with Haim, you know? Yeah, it was awesome. Because, you know, it's, 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 it, it is in that same vein. Um, to change gears like that, though, I mean, how hard is it? There is so many hooks on this record. How hard is it to, I mean, that, that seems hard to do, to write one good hook in a song, to come up with hook after hook after hook. I mean, that's got to be maddening. Patrick's good at that. Yeah. He's like a hook machine. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> a I think. Job. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, we, our, our style of writing is very much confused and we we <laughs> don't really way. stick to one method even though like we were like taking on these like ritualistic methods to create this album every song was treated in a very unique way yeah so i think um you know when trying to write the music to some song or you know elena trying to write the melody to some song um we would come at it from a different angle every time yeah so i think that was a way to keep it fresh and to keep you know like um unique melodies and newness yeah. to every song. And I think one of the reasons why this record does sound a lot different is because over the years of releases and touring, we started to learn what we wished we were playing live. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we loved everything we wrote when we wrote Cape Dory, our first record, but after like literally two months of touring that album, it's 28 minutes, surf beat every single right. song. <laughs> By the end, we were like, oh, my God, I'm having, like, insane dreams where you're the surf beat, and it's, like, taunting me, and I want to hear <laughs> something else, which just, you know, naturally pushed us in yeah. opposite directions, and we started listening to Shuggy Otis and Funkadelic, and, you know, and, I mean, we loved all of those things initially. It just took, you know, time and learning ourselves and what we wanted to be doing, and um, so that was definitely at the forefront of our mind when we wrote Ritual and Repeat. We tried to keep... Um, like Patrick and I would write separately mm -hmm. and I would be like filling a need that I had. Like I wanted a song that could be sung kind of like an old, like a Carol King song. That's mm -hmm. like almost like a standard, like an old standard mixed with a pop song. And then Patrick would want to play guitar. Like he's in a built to spill cover band or something. And together <laughs> we would just keep melding these ideas that were just, you know, selfish fulfillments until but we that's the best up. way to go forward. Yeah. Right. Like that. I mean, you know, without just picking one sound, like we're going to write a song that sounds like this. I mean, to bringing all those things in, w was it ever to a point though, that you said we have to be a different band, not so much because of personally, but because maybe critically, you know, I think we, we didn't have to say that. I yeah. think we just acted that way. I think we would we would write a song, you know, that maybe was reminiscent of Cape Dory or even Young and Old, and we would just... Feel like we'd done that already. Yeah, yeah. or it wasn't yeah. good enough or something. Yeah. And, and then I, we would just sometimes I read criticisms where they wish, like, people wish we would just keep writing songs like Marathon, our very first mm -hmm. single we ever released. And I feel like... Um, there's something really special about that song, but I could never write that song again. Mm -hmm. And I, not if I tried and not, if, and I don't even want to. And I think it's just because you need to be, I mean, you have to be making yourself happier. There's absolutely no reason yeah. to be doing it. It might be an unfair question for you. And especially since I said I was going to uh, ignore backstories, but <laughs> there is that really great story in your past about not being brought up with pop music at all yeah that it was just you you brought up on like classical and, and mm -hmm. things like that right yeah so it seems like either it would be an extra hard challenge to pick up all of these pop techniques or it's almost just like bursting with a whole new world suddenly and there it all is oh yeah totally it really was and i mean the funny thing is the more i've been reading like i just read linda ronstadt's memoir mm -hmm. and you know she's this amazing pop rock icon 70s and 80s but she grew up on the same music as i did mostly because she was like a child in the 40s or yeah. 50s yeah. or something she was but i 
she would make all these connections between old American standards, like even like Gershwin mm-hmm. songs, and what she would be doing with like the Stone Ponies mm-hmm. or something. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, because that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking like we write a 70s rock song, but I'm going to sing it like I'm Judy Garland, 1960. How would that sound? Right. And that's what that's I like. And you can usually do a connection, a line. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I forget, uh, we were talking about how to, how to get from Stravinsky, uh, Stravinsky to the Strokes. Oh yeah, w- which can be done w- without too much effort. Yeah, uh, it's it's really cool to actually, I guess, to hear a band. It's oh, kind of figured that out within. I love it. Too. See, I like. I mean, we studied. Um, this is probably irrelevant. I'm realizing, but I, I we studied philosophy in college, mm-hmm. and my favorite part about that was just seeing how the whole history of like human consciousness was this long dialogue, mm-hmm. and music is the exact same. And all I mean, all art history is like this. And that's I mean, the more that we've made music, the more I've gotten to know music and spend time with it and discover these links. Mm-hmm. That's the most incredible part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got to bring up the producers part, um, you know, before we get too far into this. Uh, it's like you picked a holy trinity. I think that's what we were going for. Yeah, the holy trinity yeah. of producers. And we got uh, Patrick Carney, uh, Black Keys. Yeah. Uh, Brian, um, um, was it not? Jimmy Jimmy Eno. Jimmy Eno. Yeah, we I did do that the, wrong. Not, yeah, this. not a relative. I even wrote yeah. it down wrong. <laughs> uh, that would have been interesting. Uh, Jim Eno from Spoon. Yeah. And one of my favorite of all times, Richard Swift. Yep. Yeah. How do you take that? Because you did. You accomplished it. How do you do that and make a cohesive album? Because it's not like they're all three completely different from each other, but those are three different sounds, and you were going Mm -hmm. for different sounds with each one. How do you make a cohesive record come out of that? Well, the unifying thread is definitely us doing all the writing, Patrick Mm -hmm. and I. So... Um, and the other thing is that we would write... We wrote this, like, giant batch of songs, but then we imagined, like, in an ideal world, like, not every song is suited to every producer mm-hmm. and um, even the best producer. So we just imagined, like, I- ideal world, who would we give which songs to? Mm-hmm. And that's what we ended up being able to do. Yeah, we didn't want to treat this like, I guess we had treated our previous albums. We wanted this to just kind of be a new thing. And we were just mm-hmm. felt like, you know, there was a batch of songs that could really benefit from the, like, power and minimalism in Patrick Carney's production. Mm-hmm. And then we felt like there was a batch of songs that could benefit from like the kind of heart and soul of and like vintageness of the Richard Swift recordings. And then there was a batch that we felt like, you know, could benefit from like the I feel like Jim is like a really delicate producer. Like he's really good at just fine tuning songs and getting all the intricacies worked out. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And we called up all these people and somehow they all said yes. It's really different, though, than, you know, with like a pop pop star goes after five different mm-hmm. producers and and it, it sounds like five different producers it i mean does, these are yeah. these are a batch of songs that was coming from the same place and yeah. then mm-hmm. individually doled out to this exactly. is what the strength we want and well, that's because that that pop star probably or usually isn't writing all those so it's sure, different sure. writers and, they and different don't have producers the choice. Yeah, yeah like right, a lot right. a lot of the higher ups don't have they don't really grant that choice to artists to work with any producer they want they, mm-hmm. cuz like it's just, you know, they don't want to risk losing money on it or something. They want to go with their tried and true. Yeah, producers. we're lucky that yeah. we get to do whatever we want, even if it's a dumb idea. Yeah. But we, <laughs> we still get to do it. Yeah. And it, it but it, it, you know, even with that, it doesn't always work for mm-hmm. every artist. And no. it did. It totally worked. Again, it comes back to being a great record. Uh, a video is out for Bad Girls, um, which is not really the first single, but ends up being the first video. And, and I, I did at least... Maybe in a TMZ sort of way, wonder is like, was there anyone you were pinpointing out in that for bad song? girls? Yeah, yeah. Actually, that song it's it's about me, but um, it's that's like the most personal song mm-hmm. on the album, probably. It? Yeah, yeah, it's the only song on the record where I wrote the lyrics first uh-huh. and wrote a melody to carry the lyrics. Mm-hmm. I never do that. Lyrics are always the very, very last thing that yeah. come in a song. But yeah, it's definitely about me um kind of realigning my beliefs about the world mm-hmm. and maybe like a little justification of that <laughs> even bad girls can do good things yeah. <laughs> i now have to go back and re-listen to that song oh yeah just yeah. with that in mind yeah. uh, i was watching the video and then i guess i was reading something else about you guys being david lynch fans and oh, yeah. uh, and and i looked at it and i was like oh it almost it, it does it it makes sense and, and maybe even in, in the uh 
the faceless uh, album artwork, how this common suburbia can look so much like a horror film. Absolutely. That's <laughs> my... Just a touch of paint. <laughs> yeah. That's it, right? yeah. I love like... I love a beautiful thing that's either a little bit ugly or a little bit frightening, yeah. but it's still beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's all come through in a really, really great record. Again, I can't compliment you guys enough on this. Thank so you. Kind Congratulations. Of you. Thank you. There it is. Part three of my uh, interview series with Tennis here. Again, that went back from the Ritual and Repeat album. And once again, the new record is called Swimmer. Thanks to the band, of course, for the conversations. Thanks to you for checking out uh, this episode. And again, uh, we have new ones every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So hopefully you'll hit subscribe so you can follow along with all the great interviews and the best ways to keep up with all of your favorite artists, what they're up to. Of course, you can also uh, give the series a rating, leave a review. That's always helpful. After that, head to WFPK.org, where I do a show Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern, an hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, and bonus interviews, too. Again, that's WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound, they've got your music and film news. You can also find me on any social media platform, at Kyle Meredith. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network. Weirdly, I have to tell you, I was looking at Twitter for the first time in a very long time yesterday, and I didn't know that you could get messages on Twitter, and I saw that you had sent us a message <laughs> that had just been languishing there. I literally didn't know you could send messages. <laughs> I'm Lior Phillips, host of This Must Be The Gig. We're a weekly podcast that documents everything about the world of live music. Speaking with choreographers, costume and set designers, the people who run beloved venues and festivals, and, of course, speaking with musicians about that one gig that changed their lives. Get your peek behind the curtain at consequenceofsound.net, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts.